This week on Brian Ross Investigates. Preparing for war. New videos show Russian troops preparing for battle near the Ukrainian border. What a Russian invasion of the Ukraine means for Americans. A stark warning of a possible cyber war that would directly affect American websites, disrupting utilities, businesses, and government. Former U.S. cyber czar Richard Clark is here with the latest. Two or three steps down the road, we could be in a cyber war with Russia. Plus, the epidemic of rage. Why are so many people losing their cool, acting out their frustrations and anger, challenging authority, as the COVID pandemic blues just won't go away? There is a little bit less sense of that there is somebody in charge, that there is somebody who's going to sort of stand the limit. And this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the choices made by the editors of Mediaite. What you see on Dr. Fauci, this is what people say to me, that he doesn't represent science to them. He represents Joseph Mengele. From the studios of the Law and Crime Trial Network in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigating. Good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to those of you watching us on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined as always tonight by my colleague, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin with warnings for Americans about a possible cyber war with Russia. The conflict in the Ukraine may feel like it's a long way off, but a top expert is telling us tonight it would not take much for it to spread quickly on the Internet to the United States, Rhonda. That's right, Brian. Tensions are high on the border between Ukraine and Russia, where the Russians have massed tens of thousands of troops and key pieces of military equipment. President Biden is predicting an invasion, and they appear to be on a war footing, Brian. And we're joined now by Richard Clark, longtime advisor to presidents on national security, the country's first a cyber czar. Mr. Clark, if uh, the invasion takes place uh, in Ukraine, we have a sense that it's a far away, it won't affect Americans. But that's not exactly true, is it? No, I think it will affect Americans. You know, last time uh, the Russians attacked Ukraine in cyberspace, uh, which was about four years ago, uh, they destroyed uh, the hardware uh, that runs most companies. Uh, and it, that attack got out of the country by mistake. And it did billions of dollars of damage in the U.S. and Europe. So what about in the United States? Are we vulnerable if uh, Russia should try to do something in Ukraine? Would it extend to our, uh, our homeland? Well, it could by mistake, as it did four years ago. But it could also do so intentionally, because this is not a one-move game. This is a move, counter-move, counter-move. So if you think three steps ahead, um, let's say they invade. We will then impose very draconian sanctions on them. They're already written. They're on the president's desk. He has only to sign them. Everybody's ready to implement them. We've even told the Russians what they are. And the Russians, in response, have said, if you do that, we will do something drastic. So what could the drastic be? The drastic could be uh, intentional cyber attacks on U.S. infrastructure. Uh, you know, the Russians on two occasions attacked Ukraine's electric power grid and shut the power off by cyber attacks. There's reason to believe they could do that in parts of the United States. Uh, the, the thing that Microsoft found over the weekend was that Russia was going into Ukrainian companies and wiping all the software. So there's no software. So the, the computers are just doorstops. Uh, that could happen here too. So what I've been advising is that companies need to think about uh, all they can do to increase their security in the weeks ahead in cyberspace, because two or three steps down the road, we could be in a cyber war with Russia. And how would we respond to that if we got into a, as you say, step after step cyber war? Well, it's not clear who would suffer more and I guess that's not really the, the issue. We would suffer. Uh, they could too, but that doesn't help us. We would suffer uh, if our power grids went out here and there, 
uh, if key infrastructure wasn't operating, uh, if companies lost all their software and their, maybe the attack even gets into their backup systems. Uh, think of it as ransomware uh, only without the ransom. Uh, ransomware on a grand scale uh, across the United States. We've never had a cyber war like that. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic. We know the Russians can do it. We know that they have said, if we do the sanctions, they will do something drastic. I don't think they're going to do anything militarily against us. That would be folly. Uh, so what else is left? Well, what else is left is cyber war. And so you see we're on the brink, really, of a potential first cyber war. I think so. Uh, now, we don't really know what Putin's plan is. I think only Putin knows, and he may not have made up his mind yet. What he is doing is everything that he needs to do to invade Ukraine. Uh, he's done, it, let, let's say hypothetically, there are 20 steps that you need to do if you're the Russian military. Uh, he, he's done 17, 18 of them. Uh, and so as Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, was saying this week, and Tony Blinken was saying this week, the attack could now come at any time because the amount of time that it takes to do the remaining steps and then invade is so short uh, that we wouldn't have warning. We, we have warning now, we're not gonna get any more. You don't like to give odds, but what do you think are the prospects for a diplomatic resolution? Here? I, don't, I don't give odds. I, you know, I used to be in the intelligence business uh, and I was always asked by uh, policymakers, uh, what are the odds of this? What are the odds of that? And I went back historically and looked what we had answered in the past. We we're always wrong. <laughs> so what, I, what I say instead is, rather than giving you the odds, I say, what's in the way of it happening? Uh, are there impediments to a certain thing happening? Uh, and how difficult would it be to overcome those impediments? Uh, we could have a diplomatic settlement, sure, uh, if the Russians wanted it. Um, but they'd have to eat a lot of crow because they made demands, diplomatic demands, that they know NATO can't give them. They demanded that NATO never admit any other organization, uh, any other nation into the, into the organization. Sweden wants to get in, Finland wants to get in. And they know that might happen, it's certainly gonna happen before Ukraine. The interesting thing is he demanded, Putin demanded that we not let Ukraine in. NATO was never going to do that. I mean, it really wasn't on the table. This is a made up crisis. Uh, so for a diplomatic settlement, um, you could put all sorts of fig leaves on it, but basically uh, Putin would not get uh, nine out of the 10 things he's demanded. Worst case, if it begins, there is an invasion and the sanctions and the back and forth begins. What's the exit ramp? What's the off ramp to end it? Well, so there are two scenarios people are talking about. One is he invades and takes over the whole country, motivated by a desire to recreate the Soviet Union. Uh, if he does that, the price is very high because there'll be a guerrilla war. The Ukrainians are not going to roll over. Uh, they'll, they'll do kind of what the Iraqis did when the Americans charged up to, to Baghdad. They'll hold for a while, they'll fight for a while conventionally, and then they'll disappear into the countryside uh, and fight a guerrilla war that could be very, very costly, especially if we help the guerrillas uh, as we did when the Russian army invaded Afghanistan. Well, we gave arms and assistance to the fighters in Afghanistan, if you remember way back in the 80s, uh, and it was so bad the Russians pulled out. Uh, we could make that happen again. That's scenario one, less likely. Scenario two is he grabs a piece here and a piece there. Right now, he has a geography problem. He's already grabbed a piece of land in the Black Sea called Crimea, and there's no land connection from Russia to it. So what he might do is grab a piece of Ukraine about 100 miles wide so that he has a land connection to Crimea. He might grab that. He might grab something in the north, uh, and he might try a military-related uh, coup to overthrow the government in Ukraine. But I think those are, are much more likely steps than having him swallow the whole country. All right, Richard Clark, thank you so much for being uh, with us tonight. As always, excellent insight into what's happening overseas. Thank you, Brian. 
Up next, an epidemic of rage in this country. Americans losing their cool as COVID-19 takes its toll on our civility. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. We turn now to what appears to be an epidemic of rage in this country, with leading mental health experts saying we are seeing yet another one of the symptoms of COVID-19. This morning, fallout growing from this disturbing flight fight, ending in a passenger being wrapped in tape. Help! 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 It's life back in the sky. Okay. We don't stand up, it's only gonna get worse. Unruly passengers. Help me! Help me! bizarre incidents all taking place inside planes Cell phone video captured this unruly customer refusing to follow the local rules to wear a mask at the Kabuki restaurant in Woodland Hills. A violent altercation at a McDonald's in Indiana. A customer spitting on a hostess in San Jose. Even a brazen dine and dash attempt in New Jersey. We're seeing it across the country, unruly customers acting out, and restaurant workers say they're fed up. To get a better understanding of what's going on, we're joined by Karen Moss, a psychologist who works outside Washington, D.C. And Karen, what's behind this epidemic of rage? There is a, a general uh, sense of loss of control. I think definitely since the uh, pandemic, people feel like things are not getting back to normal, even when we sort of loosened up a little bit in the fall, things aren't really the same as they were. Schools aren't the same, travel isn't the same, shopping experiences aren't the same. And because there's so many, these, these sort of small and subtle differences, people are frustrated and they feel like they don't have a sense of control of, over their lives like they did prior. Not everyone's getting violent. Why are those who are expressing their rage with violence, why are they acting that way? I think that's a good question. Um, and I think that, that we don't really know the answer definitively. Um, I do think there is a general shift in the way people trust one another. I think that there is a general mistrust of authority. Um, and so it, in the past, when people were sort of comfortable with the manager or the person at the front desk or the principal of the school, um, they sort of believed that, that those people in authority had your best interest at heart. All of a sudden, um, they don't believe that anymore. And I think that the more skeptical a person is, the more doubtful the person is in, um, in, in authority. I think they, you know, get more frustrated and more rageful. And what do you tell your clients who have these kinds of issues? How do they control themselves? How do they handle this? When people are experiencing intense emotion, there are internalizing problems like depression or anxiety. And then there are externalizing problems like anger and rage. When we're talking about rage, we're talking about people who lose control of their emotions, they're sort of putting them onto others in their environment. So the bad feelings that they're having 
are other people's fault and are because of what other people are doing to them versus sort of internalizing the issue and making it about them. And yet there have been warnings from law enforcement they're going to go after those who act out on airplanes or restaurants. This continues though, even so. They don't fear yeah. the law? I think there is a little bit less sense of that there is somebody in charge, that there is somebody who's going to sort of stand the limit. And so yes, um, authorities are called on airplanes, um, but I don't, I, I don't think that people are putting their trust into, into leaders right now. And to what extent do you see this rage factor essentially amplified on social media at certain broadcast outlets? I think um, one of the, the unique aspects of the times we're living in is that everybody has a video capability on their phone. And when there is any sort of confrontation at all, if you look around, you see that everybody is videotaping it on their phones. and. I think this amplifies the problem and makes it seem so much more of a common issue than, than it might even be. Um, we Every time there's a big blow up or every time somebody loses their cool, there is video recording of it and it is put on TikTok or another platform and for everybody else to see. So what do you tell people about how to keep their cool? It's a good question. Um, we have to talk about why emotions are so intense right now. And the best thing to do before you understand how to keep your cool is to understand why you're feeling the frustration you're feeling to begin with. I think um, people depersonalize others right now, um, rather than understanding that everybody's just trying to do their best and taking time to understand when your feelings are getting ramped up so it doesn't go automatically you sort of overheat if you start feeling frustrated if you start feeling um worried or out of control then you know you have to remove yourself from a situation take time take deep breaths and basically recalibrate and keep your cool karen moss thank you so much for being with us here tonight you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Up next, this week's winners and losers in the media. See what the editors of Media had, had to say about Fox News. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams Media Group. And Aidan, you've chosen as a winner this week, Fox News. Now, given all the rants and misinformation, why are they a winner? That's right. So putting aside all the criticism of the Fox News that we've made on this, on this segment repeatedly, uh, and putting aside what you think of uh, the network's politics, uh, it goes without saying that Fox News is the most watched thing on cable news. Uh, it draws an audience that is far bigger than MSNBC and CNN, often far bigger than MSNBC and CNN combined. Um, that has been the case this week uh, on Friday, which is typically a pretty soft day for cable news networks. Uh, no show on Fox News drew less uh, than a million viewers, um, which is a sizable audience. Uh, CNN uh, and MSNBC were far behind. Uh, CNN didn't even draw uh, more than 700,000 viewers for any single show, uh, even their top rated shows. Um, so it was really a strong uh, ratings week for Fox News. Uh, and that comes at a time when all of cable news audiences are down. Uh, so the, Fox, the fact that Fox is still pulling in a really sizable audience is a sign of their influence uh, and their continued success. And suggest they're just shrugging off the criticism because it works. Right. I mean, I think Fox News, that's been their play uh, since its inception. Um, you know, no matter how many times uh, the New York Times op-ed page uh, runs a lengthy piece criticizing uh, Fox News um, as a danger to democracy, uh, viewers continue to tune in um, and are, in fact, probably spurred by that. 
Um, so I think Fox News sees the profits continuing to, to come in and the audience continuing to be there. Uh, and they really don't care about any of that criticism. Uh, a lot of times that criticism is justified. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a good thing. Um, but the audience continues to tune in. And for this week's Loser, you've chosen the former CBS 60 Minutes correspondent, Laura Logan, who hasn't been seen much on the air since she made these comments about Dr. Fauci on Fox. What you see on Dr. Fauci, this is what people say to me, that he doesn't represent science to them. He represents Joseph Mengele, Dr. Joseph Mengele, uh, the, doc, the Nazi doctor who did experiments on Jews during the Second World War and in the concentration camps. And so she has disappeared from the airwaves since that. Right. Uh, this is a good example of what is being aired on Fox News not being worthy of a win, uh, despite uh, <laughs> the audience still being there. Uh, Laura Logan uh, was a once revered journalist for 60 Minutes. Um, she took to appearing on Fox News a lot lately in the last year uh, and pushed a series of conspiracy theories. What you saw there was her comparing uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci to uh, an infamous Nazi doctor, uh, Joseph Mengele. Uh, after those comments, which prompted a lot of outrage, uh, criticism and calls for her firing, she disappeared from the air at Fox News. Now, she was never employed by Fox, but she appeared frequently as an unpaid guest on the network and actually hosted a documentary show on Fox Nation. Now, she hasn't appeared on Fox News since. Uh, we reported on Mediaite uh, on Monday uh, that she had also been dropped by her longtime agent, uh, who was at United Talent Agency, or UTA. So not only is she no longer appearing on Fox News, she's also been dropped by her agency, um, which is a pretty big deal for any journalist and means that it's going to be hard to see where Laura Logan is going to be able to get her news out now. Um, that she's basically fully independent and has no representation. Um, I doubt any you know, of the traditional networks are going to be hosting her. Uh, Fox News certainly has signaled that they're not going to be hosting her anymore on their airwaves. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a serious loss for, for you know, a once revered journalist. And a, a stunning fall from grace and from prestige. Right. I mean, Laura Logan was, you know, was a very, very prestigious journalist when she was at 60 Minutes. And, you know, it was a bit, a bit of a long time coming. Yeah. Um, she's made a series of controversial comments on Fox News. This was just the latest and the most controversial that got her All kicked right. off. The well, Aiden McLaughlin, thank you so much for being with us tonight. As always, your picks are the winners and the losers. And thanks to all of you for watching us. We'll see you back here again next week on the Law and Crime Trial Network.